Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 51st episode of Retuning Your Firm. Got a really packed panel, packed topics today. Um, as you may have seen from the uh, invite I sent round, uh, I think the, the easiest way to think about today was that it's going to be about ethics. It's going to be about the way that firms work internally, but also the sort of clients they work with. So very much like to welcome our guests, um, Kent Shuttleworth, who is the founding, founding partner of Make Architects. And he's talking about his firm's policy on stepping down from projects unless clients want to do the right thing. Interesting thought. My second guest today is David Wallace. And David is the director of Wallace Marketing. And he's gonna talk about a topic which some people on the marketing people on the call might find interesting of ethical marketing, um, being in alignment with the behaviors of your people on the front line and what you say about in your messages. Um, our third guest, a regular if you like, is uh, Jeremy Beard, who is the managing partner of Hayes McIntyre and um, <clears throat> Francesca Lagerberg. And I think last week I called her my companion on the, on the show. And I think, I think that's probably accurate. This is her 49th appearance. Uh, and she's the global leader network capabilities for Grant Thornton. And the usual, uh, the way we organize it as usual is that, but I will be talking you through the poll and then uh, invite Ken and then David to uh, share their five minute slots. And then we will then move to Jeremy and Francesco who will be uh, joining for the panel session. Um, so what, what's been going on uh, in terms of this week? Well, just sort of, again, really pleased with the number of you who are signing up for the uh, our, uh, the Re Reaching Your Firm Summit, which is coming up on the 22nd of June, just over a month away now. If you haven't yet booked your ticket, uh, now's a chance to do it. Uh, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. 28 panelists in a couple of hours. David will tell me as a marketing expert, that's uh, disastrous because you're so risky. But actually, guess what? We've done it twice. It works. Um, more importantly, and for some people, I've literally got hundreds. We had, I think, two and a half thousand people who watched the videos from this show over the past 28 days, which is really, really high numbers. Um, so the, the two slots from today will be appearing in that collection. So do watch them because they're, they're there on the website and they're free. Um, peer groups, we look like we might have three or four new peer group members this month. That's really going well for us. And, and why? Because guess what? When managing partners, COOs are looking into an uncertain future, sitting down with a really small group of people, the same group will, gives you a chance to really explore thoughts and come up with ideas. Float the ideas that you as the managing partner don't mention to your fellow partners because you know that they will be seen as totally stupid. But at the end of the day, often the way the best idea works is through being smashed, crashed, trashed, and generally given a hard time before something vaguely similar emerges at the end, otherwise known as the innovation process. So um, do think about joining our peer groups because they're great. Um, and also the new 24 seven networking clubs, which we're just kind of starting up slowly. But the idea there is that you don't just sit as you are at the moment in a webinar, watching me and others talking, but you have a chance to actually talk to and interact with some of the people who are on the show, um, both sort of through discussion forum and then once a month through a social in the Remo platform. So you really can have a private conversation. So, so that's, those are just, we're starting to roll them out now. And there is one for this group, as you know, returning your firm. And then lastly, before we move on, um, we're going to be running the awards on the 10th of June. David Wallace was one of our judges, so he might want to mention that. And this is the venue that we're going to be showing you. We're going to having because I thought, well, it's in the middle of June, 10th of June. So why don't we get together in a beautiful Italian garden? I mean, normally you can't have your awards in a garden because guess what? It might rain or, you know, and it gets cold and windy. I mean, Holland Park might be a bit different, but even that's got a big tent over it. But why don't we go in and just have lovely awards in a gorgeous environment? So, um, so that was our plan. So um, moving on. What are we talking about today? Well, as you probably know, um, the feedback from the UK government on our polls has been amazing over the past few months. Um, and I think it was um, Michael Minnelli who was reinforcing that message on the, the show last week. Um, at the point is, I guess it's kind of obvious in a way is that we really focus on the middle market and that's the hardest bit for government to tap into. They can do a bilateral with a big firm, PwC, Accenture, whatever, really easily. Uh, they can obviously talk to unis and others about entrepreneurs and uh, people who are at that level. But the middle market, you're all very busy. You haven't got time to worry about government unless it's a regulatory issue that needs serious attention. And then your professional body will probably do it for you. 
But how do you find out what's going on through the mind of the leader in a professional firm? And you, you're the guys on this call, and I really, really appreciate you completing these surveys. So, so thank you for that. So what are we doing today? Well, before we go on to this week, let's just run back through what were the key messages coming from last week. So we did the monthly sector tracker, you may recall. So I thought rather than showing a lot of images, I'll just take you through some of the key messages and, um, and then we can reflect on whether we think those are important in other contexts. So firstly, where are the priorities? And there's really two, uh, operational efficiency and developing a clear strategy. Now, I think as some of you will be aware, uh, my view is that over the past year, that the operational side has sort of, or rather strategy has lost ground to operation. Uh, there's lockdown to operations that people have been so busy on the day job that they haven't possibly therefore focused as much as they could on the strategy and saying, well, it's uncertainty is actually not a good reason for not doing strategy. It's probably the right reason for doing strategy. What else? Well, what are, what are partners talking about? Um, the two areas, finances and marketing. David will be here, pleased to hear that, a marketing expert. Um, and why? Well, because those are the things that, you know, if, if the money isn't there, and the clients aren't there, then that's a problem. And it isn't about client service. That's been pretty good. It's about the new, new business generation. That's where the real focus is in the partner directed discussions. What's going on in terms of uh, expansion contraction? Well, last month, 94% of you were expecting expansion in new work. 81% of you were expecting headcount expansion. 75% were expecting growth and activity levels. These are very, very high. I mean, if we look at the, the images that I've been showing you through the months, and this is the only chart I'm going to show you, the red ones are contraction and the blue is expansion. Pretty clearly around about November time, this is obviously when the vaccine happened, uh, it suddenly shifted from red in the ascendancy to blue in the ascendancy. And, you know, broadly, that's remained the case. And all the firms I talked to are surprised at how buoyant. And remember back in April of last year, how we all thought that our revenues were going to drop 30% plus. And that was the number we, we surveyed then. So what else came out from last week? Um, over 90% of leaders are seen as accessible. And Andrew Hekabadzi, who is one of our board members, says that's an exceptionally high number uh, for any sector. So, you know, the leadership has clearly been doing its bit. There were some other really good stats from the levers as well. What's getting in the way? Um, Financial health of clients is the one cloud on the horizon, I think people would say, in terms of achieving optimal performance. The improving uh, economic climate and the poor economic climate was a much bigger issue than, than a couple of months ago than it is now. And what then happens? Well, we move into supply mode slightly in a sense that skills gaps are now starting to emerge pretty much for the first time in a year. Um, <clears throat> I suspect it will be... Um, <clears throat> staff turnover coming following through after that. So in other words, the management, instead of being, let's focus on getting the job done, is going back to, ooh, have we got the people to do the work? Um, and that, that I think is a big shift. Um, we've had a year of the other way around, I guess. In terms of um, working from home, about half the people expect to be working from home. And needless to say, that means that about half the firms are anticipating using less office space. And that's normally 20% plus less office space. So quite a big chunk of stuff there. So, so that was really, those are really the key messages that came out from last week. Um, thank you for completing it. Um, what are we doing today? Well, I wanted to do a slightly different poll. Um, our finance group um, meets every four or five weeks. And one of the topics that they're looking at is the whole issue of London waiting allowance. In other words, um, this is quite a big percentage. I won't say the number because I'm going to ask you if you know what it is for your firm, but it's quite a big number. And um, what's going to happen once we get into that, let's call it post-COVID world. So rather than just asking the one question, we're doing a sort of proper salaries and benefits poll. So we're going to look at what's, what's the cost of employing people, includes partners, by the way, with a notional salary. Uh, what sort of benefits, bonuses are you providing? What's the value of those benefits? If you've got a bonus scheme, is it effective? Uh, how often are you reviewing salaries? How often are you reviewing the range of benefits or are they kind of set in stone? To what extent are you London-based firm? What's the value of your London waiting allowance? And I'm allowing you to put unsure because I appreciate not everybody on the call will have that data to hand. And what are you planning post COVID to that waiting allowance? And is there a difference between what you're planning for current employees and new employees? Are you going to start having different salary rates effectively, depending on whether people have just joined or 
were previously with you. I don't know the answer to some of those questions and that's what makes these polls really interesting. So assuming a notional salary for equity partners equivalent to the highest paid employee, what's the total salary cost? And as you have identified, and this is certainly the research we've seen, between 50, a little over, about sort of 57, 58 is probably the median. It can drop as low as 50, it can be up to about 70. So uh, good, that's great. About 20% of you aren't sure. So that may be something that you need to be aware of because it's a pretty big percentage. In terms of what are the things that you're doing, you have discretionary bonus scheme, that's 95% of you. Small amount on paid overtime. Um, the other big ones are obviously non statutory pension, external training courses. Um, everybody gives one of them. In terms of the approximate value of benefits in the range 10 to 20%, which again, I think is fairly, fairly standard. Again, 20% aren't sure, but possibly their role doesn't involve finances to any great extent. Um, this is my slightly interesting one. We kind of looked at the impact of um, the discretionary bonus scheme on encouraging the type of behavior that management would like. Um, I mean, in other words, I remember the financial services industry always used to say the, the bigger the bonus, the reduce, the lower the loyalty, which I think is kind of what this isn't saying. But uh, anyway, yeah, unfortunately, what are you looking at here? Well, there's a big chunk who are saying it's effective, which is great, 47%, but there's also about another 20% who are saying it's ineffective. So sort of the jury is slightly out on that one, I guess. <coughs> How often are salaries reviewed? As you'd imagine, everybody's annual. Uh, and equally, bonuses, um, sorry, benefits um, less often than annually. I sense that occasionally they are just allowed to, to sit in a collection and nobody's really going through and reviewing the, is the mix right. And I think as we move into the hybrid world, a lot of those possibly gym and some of the other benefits, the car allowance maybe will be different. It's interesting yesterday that London was full of traffic and the tubes were empty. So what does that mean? Um, so, um, Okay, in terms of prior to lockdown, we've got about half of you were all London, three quarters, 20%, uh, around three quarters, and, um, and nobody 20%. So again, mainly a London audience, but by no means exclusively, as we know. So um, in terms of those with no London, obviously it doesn't apply, but in terms of the people who are in London, um, for those who are sure, but even Stevens between no uplift at all, in other words, the same rate for everybody, and less than 20%. Now, as it happens, the, uh, there's some research that came out from, I think, Willis, which said that the typical London uh, discount, um, or the discount other regions play to London is 22%, which means the uplift is 28%. Uh, so actually, it would look like this group are not are paying less of a London uplift than other industries. So that wasn't legal only, that was across the board, by the way. Um, so um, what's happening post COVID? Well, again, excluding the ones no London office, uh, most of you are not planning to make any adjustments and some people are keeping the review, but nobody's actually making any, uh, only 5% have yet to decide. So that's a fairly clear one. And in terms of new people, um, again, there is pretty much the same patterns emerging. So. It isn't, there aren't really any fundamental changes between new and empl current employees because that could be divisive even if salaries are supposed to be um, known to everybody. Right, okay, well, that's probably about enough from the polls and I will hand over to Ken, our first guest, who's going to talk to us about um, when, when you might say no to a client or when you might even decide not to work with a client. Over to you, sir. So when we fairly make back in 2004, we became very vocal in championing energy efficient and low carbon design and the use of responsible materials. And these values are central to our business. Our mantra is simply to do the right thing. And we set ourselves up as employee owned business. And I felt it was the right thing to do on many, many levels. Everyone bought into the values feels wholly involved in and engaged on from day one. And it also is an effective business model financially. Everyone is rewarded equally for the profit in the profits. So as skin in the game, despite misconceptions, the employee ownership uh, route is sound, well-managed and solid model. It's also very rewarding. And we explore design solutions where everybody can pitch in with design ideas. There's no barriers, but it's not a kibbutz, it's properly run. Environmental, social and governance is taken very seriously. 
in making. We have an internal team, a sort of ginger group for sort of pushing forward uh, a low carbon future. And they share the knowledge and best practice and innovations and learnings and help to educate our teams so we can explore and find the right best solutions to keep abreast of changing policy in the complex climate agenda. But we've also recognized now we need to push even harder if change isn't happening quickly enough. So we're now working together with our like-minded clients and consultants to make a difference. It's easy to be distracted by COVID, but as we come out of it, we cannot lose sight of the biggest issue facing us all, the very future of our planet. As architects, we feel we have a duty to enhance people's lives, transform environments and help protect the world and make it a better place for people now and in the future. As lockdown showed that what cities would look like without pollution, blue skies, clearer seas, nature returning, a real wake up call. And I think we all need to raise awareness using every means possible to be the voice of positive change regardless of sector. In architecture, there's all sorts of assessments to test sustainability of buildings, but we're learning that sometimes the measures don't really work for the user. So they become pointless. There's a real danger that it slips to becoming a box ticking exercise rather than meaningful, real and meaningful action that will really make a difference. So we're interrogating what we do, what measures we put in place that building users can use and want, and those will have a lasting positive impact. Internally, we've said, don't look back. What's done is done. Now is the moment to look ahead at what should be done better. And that's been our challenge to clients too. No more excuses or looking for others to solve. We all need to act now with our eyes, only looking forward to how we can shape the future. And you have to be engaged in those tricky conversations to have influence. In our field on a macro scale, the problem areas around transport, air travel in particular, but also city density. And on a micro scale, how our own operations are run. And it requires difficult conversations, but they have to be had. And we shouldn't shirk from that responsibility. And we all know it's policy that gives real incentive, but the policy is not coming quickly enough. So we can't wait. We need to get engaged in how we make our own industries can improve and keep pushing other solutions. Other investors with the money and the connections have a huge role to play to make an impact on policy, a local, national and global level. And some, thankfully, have similar values to, to ours and are already only investing in low carbon solutions. So at MAKE, we're very active in undertaking research, exploring ideas, evolving solutions by engaging our clients to make a difference and to ask those difficult questions. How can buildings be more fit, energy efficient? How can we adopt what's there? Can we innovate? What is the operational embodied carbon, life cycle, circular economy, supply chain, materiality? We all stand very firmly behind those values. And we've given ourselves the permission to turn work down and walk away from those who don't share our values, who just don't get it, or just don't care. However, our first approach is always to positively influence and change their minds, interrogate the brief and build on it, to be very transparent, to think about beyond the obvious barriers. We design workshops, open dialogue, to do everything possible we can persuade, cajole and steer. Overall, our business processes, we work hard to reflect our values so that we attract like-minded people to us, recruits, clients, consultants and suppliers in that way. Up front, we know that their values and ethics align with our own. We don't subscribe to box ticking, the bandwagon ambulance chasing or tokenism. For example, in the wake of the George Floyd tragedy and Black Lives Matter movement, we didn't just support the social media campaign. We took stock and established an equity, diversity, and inclusion group and have engaged external consultants, consultants to help us better understand and talk openly about the issues, educate ourselves and raise awareness to bring about change. Our teams meet bi-monthly and have established a working program that transcends our practice and many of our initiatives and outreach work in schools, universities and charities as a result. Doing the right thing as a business and individually is one thing, but ultimately there is an urgent need for regulation to enforce positive action from those who are more reluctant. There is a need for personal action too. I think change the direction of our own firms to only work with those who can convince the Dutch planet lightly will make a huge difference. So together we have an extraordinary reach. And I'm sure that for many of you, I'm probably preaching to the converted, but it's great to have the opportunity to debate these critical issues. And the race to COP26 
in November is probably the most crucial gathering of world leaders and seen by many as a last chance to make a difference on global warming. So let's use it as an opportunity and a milestone for our individual firms to think about credible differences we can make internally with our clients and suppliers. Let's make November a line in the sand to galvanize our teams and bring brilliant solutions. So for another way, stealing the, from the title of the series, let's lose it as a moment to reach you in our firms. Thanks, Ken. And what's interesting there, I think, is your, your, your focus on values and the importance of your values and making sure that they are in alignment with, with your clients' values. And in a way, I think, sadly, a lot of firms perhaps don't start with their own values. Um, and it would be interesting because David Wallace, our next presenter, is talking about ethical marketing. But if you don't know what your values are, it's very hard for your marketing team to articulate those values in a way that will resonate with the clients. And then that hopefully will reduce the need to have those difficult conversations with clients that you really didn't know quite well enough before you started the process. Um, David, please come and share your thoughts on ethical marketing. Morning, everyone. Um, yeah, Richard has asked me to speak about ethical marketing today, um, which at the beginning, uh, when he first asked, I thought that's that's fairly straightforward. Um, and then further thinking about it, it's, it's a little bit more difficult than, um, than it might at first seem. Um, so for quite a few people, marketing uh, tends to be synonymous with um, tricks, so marketing tricks, marketing ploys, marketing spin. Um, so ethical marketing may seem like an oxymoron to some people. Um, and for sure, there's, there's a fair amount of bad practice around in marketing. Um, although I'm sure everyone in the call today is a, a nice marketing halo shining above their head as we speak. Um, so kind of bear with me for a few minutes. I'm going to give a, a quick snapshot of what ethical marketing is, and why it's important in commercial terms, for professional services firms and a few points to consider for, uh, for your own firm's marketing. So starting off with what, what is ethical marketing? Um, well, that's kind of difficult because what's ethical is a matter of moral judgment. Um, so it may differ from person to person within a firm. It may differ from firm to firm, country to country, and even be different at different times. Um, but for simplicity today, let's define it as doing the right thing. Um, I think also to take a pretty broad view of marketing, so not just communications, not just what you say to others outside your, outside your business, um, but also about the product and service provided, um, how and where it's delivered, the price being charged, um, the people um, who are providing the service, how it's promoted, the processes that clients go through, and um, pretty, pretty much, in other words, across the whole marketing mix. Um, so for me, ethical marketing is doing the right thing at every stage of the marketing process. And it's more a philosophy um, than, than a strategy. And kind of summing it up in, in five key areas, um, it's about taking responsibility um, to increase the, the good that your firm does, um, reduce the harm, if any, um, that's kind of more, I guess, I guess a little bit more um, applicable to other types of business, for example, manufacturing than it, than it would be to professional services firms. Um, but also in terms of taking responsibility, looking to all those who are affected by your business, so employees, uh, the owners, the partners themselves, clients, suppliers, the communities in which the firm operates, society in general, the environment. Um, so it's all about being socially and environmentally responsible. Um, it's also about telling the truth. Um, so it's not really about spin. Um, it's about being honest and transparent and being fair in all the firm's dealings, obviously complying with the law, um, making sure that kind of touching on, on some of the stuff that Ken and uh, Richard have just mentioned, and making sure that every organisation in your supply chain um, is also uh, behaving ethically, and if they're not, um, then by association, and um, neither, neither are you. Um, so moving on to why it's important commercially, um, <clears throat> and at the moment, it's it, again, it's a bit difficult because so many 
organisations um, kind of outside business are behaving as ethically um, as as they might. Um, however, for for professional services firms, trust is at the heart of of the brand, and any firm that engages in disreputable or dishonest marketing is going to destroy trust in its brand over the longer term. So in the short in the short term, definitely there might be some gains to be had um, by, you know, maybe um, not quite telling the truth. Um, but to maintain the firm's reputation and develop a long-term relationship with clients, um, the marketing really needs to be ethical. And some kind of proof of, of why that's important in, in research by the communications firm Edelman in 2019. Um, 81% of people um, said that being able to trust a brand to do what is right is a deal breaker or the deciding factor in their buying decision. And then further than that, um, when they do trust a brand, then they reward them. So they're more likely to buy the service first. They're more likely to remain not loyal. They're more likely to be an advocate for the firm. Um, and when you think about the fact that it costs much more to acquire a new client than retain an existing one, um, all of that comes together to, <clears throat> to pointing to there being a, a really um, important, significant fee income benefit uh, to being ethical in your marketing as well. And I think there's other benefits out with that. So um, can I, I guess non-marketing benefits like staff recruitment and retention and being the type of firm that people uh, that people want to come and work for and to, to continue to, to work for. Then kind of thinking about how to be ethical, you know, some points for the firms to, to consider. And, and I started looking around for some good examples of ethical marketing. And in doing that, and again, going back to a point that Richard made, um, I came to the conclusion that it's not really about what you look as if you're doing, um, but it's more about... Um, I guess what I might call inside out marketing. And um, so being your firm's true self and um, not necessarily running superficial, look at us, we're all ethical um, marketing campaigns. So it's more about a way of doing business rather than, uh, for example, finding what seems like a good marketing bandwagon to etch onto. Um, so you might remember two or three years ago, there's a flurry of professional services firms, other corporates all supporting uh, Pride. Um, Marston Spencer stuck a rainbow on a sandwich and called it an LGBT sandwich. Um, I'm not sure that's that's that ethical at the end of the day. Um, I think this year's um, bandwagon might be climate change with COP26 coming up. Um, so look out for lots of firms thinking there, there's something for us to, um, to look ethical about. Um, so looking at some of the key things I think that firms might consider, um, the first one is, do you know what your staff, clients, and so on, believe is the right thing for you to be doing? Um, so it's not very well saying, let's do the right thing, but what do people think you should actually be doing? Um, are, are ethics um, instilled in your firm's mission, values, and culture? So I'd say that's the, way to, that's the place to start rather than what kind of campaign might, might be run. Um, is your marketing authentically ethical or have you engaged in any marketing ploys like the ones I've just uh, just mentioned? Uh, do you ever <coughs> over-exaggerate um, or use false claims to attract new clients? Um, so I've seen lots of um, there's limited space at our webinars, book early. Um, I've seen lots of we're the only firm to do this or we've got the best, um, we've got the best lawyers, etc. Um, in some cases that might be true. Um, in other cases, I think it might be uh, stretching a little bit. Um, and then going back to <clears throat> a couple of points already made, um, how ethical is your supply chain? Are you sourcing sustainable materials for your marketing? Um, and really importantly, how ethical are your clients' businesses? Um, and just to finish off, I think a litmus test for all of this is, do you ever feel just a little bit guilty about any aspect of your marketing. And if you if you do, then there's probably something wrong. And, and actually, a last point uh, that I would make is that in all of my in-house roles, um, the legal team has signed off on, on marketing. So I used to work for a law firm before that, <clears throat> before that a bank and before that consumer electronics company. In each of those, um, all marketing 
was run by the legal team to make sure it complied <clears throat> with any relevant laws. And actually, that's a really useful uh, process. So one that I'd recommend as well. Thank you very much. You too. And, and what I didn't say, I think, was that you were a proud winner of our awards in previous years when you worked for that law firm. And maybe there was something to do with your ethical marketing campaigns there. Um, Francesca, come and share with us your thoughts today on we've been slightly more centric around ethics today and, and related matters. But, but what, what are the takeaways you've heard today? Well, that, that there's there's such a strong piece here around values, aren't there? You know, having a, a, a corporate value that isn't just something you stick on your wall. It's about how you live, how you operate um, and, and how you make sure that you really, um, really bring that into your day to day life. And um, one, one of the things I always find quite intriguing is that you can take when you're in a global organization or a multi-country organization is that different countries have, have got quite different cultural acceptability so when you might have a value about a type of client that you would have you can often get cultural variations which creates a wonderful diversity of how you cope with that classic one is cannabis um, it's got medicinal value in certain countries and recognised as being legal, and it's completely illegal in others. So, you know, it, being able to to manage those those different cultural variations um, really tests you on your ethical knowledge. Do you say absolutely no, or do you say no in certain circumstances? An absolute no might be you don't want to work for pornography clients, uh, and no in certain circumstances might depend on local rules. So a really good challenge for us around um, around the kind of clients you want. I really like the point, I think both of the, the first clients, both, both Ken and David mentioned about transparency, being really open about what you're trying to do, um, trying to live that as much as you can. But the more open you are, the more uh, the more clear that your people understand what you're trying to achieve and can call you to account if uh, the senior leadership doesn't do it. I think it is uh, that ethical, strong ethical approach. It's a huge talent attractor. Uh, and it's not just Generation Z, is it? I think everybody wants to work for an organisation they're proud of that gives them a sense that they are working for a place with purpose and genuinely led by a, by a strong moral underpinning. But we all know things go wrong. You know, people do things they wish they hadn't done. People mess up. People make mistakes. And there's a very long tail around some of these, particularly around audits, where it can go on for years. An issue that actually arose in 2011, 2012, might only surface eight, nine years later. Um, and therefore, I think that you, you, know, you have to just accept the things you've done wrong, try and put them right, make sure the processes are in place to prevent it happening again, and also be really honest about that and, uh, and really make sure you do the best um, to, to not make mistakes if the mistakes were made, but also to explain what's happened to try and prevent those things uh, reoccurring. We all work in a very litigious and a very uh, complex environment. So no one's ever going to get everything right. This isn't going to happen. But um, it's what you learn from it and what you do with it that feels the most important piece. Thank you. Um, Jeremy, um, welcome back to the show. Um, nice to have you with us today. Um, we, I'm really interested. There's a number of things which, which come up today, which I really, really like your thoughts on. Um, there's the question of uh, post -hi uh, hybrid world salaries at one at London Waiting Allowance. Your firm just has London people. I'm not asking you to be specific about that, but just whether it's a matter that was raised or whether it was discussed in any way, I leave it up to you whether you want to share that one at all. Um, obviously aware that recently there's been a, a, a client which um, resulted in some adverse publicity for your firm. I won't say any more than that, it's public domain. Um, but again, really picking up Francesca's point about how you, how you go on beyond where you're at. It may have happened sometime in the past, I don't know, but, but and any thoughts on that? And then generally around, you know, what, what would be the rules that would encourage you to um, uh, cull a client, I suppose is one way of putting it, or not to work with a client? And <clears throat> would that stretch beyond the client to say it's funding or some other dimension? Uh, slam into uh, uh, I don't know, supply chain or something like that. So quite a few thoughts today, which I'd love your, your, your insight on to the extent you feel happy to do so. Absolutely, Richard. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Nice to see everyone again today. I have made an exception by joining the call today because uh, at Hayes, Hayes McIntyre today, it is meeting free Friday. So uh, no, meet, no meetings, which is great. Um, but, but uh, delighted to make an exception to join to join this call. Um, yeah, I, I'll run through those those three points, Richard, and, and, and very happy to talk 
about them. First of all, London waiting, I suppose we don't really give that any thought because we are a, a single London office. It doesn't really impact us and we, we certainly aren't making any sort of thoughts around if people are home working more and flexible in the new environment, which I'm, which I'm sure is going to happen, um, whether that means we should reduce salaries or anything like that. I think, you know, we, we're certainly not thinking along those lines. I think market forces will dictate. Um, I think our scarce, scarcest resource continues and will continue to be people. And the challenge to recruit and retain the best talent will continue. Um, what we have said is we can start to look further afield in terms of opening that recruitment net for potential people to work with us. And, and they don't have to be in striking distance of London. They can be any part of the country, arguably, you might say, in certain instances, any part of the world. And so that might have a knock on impact in terms of salary costs, et cetera, et cetera. But certainly that is not a driver for us at the moment around thinking about what savings there might be in that area. As I say, I think market forces will dictate. Um, referring to the, 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 the matter that, that we've received some negative publicity on, uh, I, I'd absolutely agree with Francesca that the key for us is how we've responded to that and how we've dealt with that um, and, and not to shy away from it and to be absolutely transparent about it and, and open about it, whilst also um, being proportionate. We, we, we mustn't um, we, we must absolutely take on board everything, but we must also not panic um, and, and um, address these things. And, and certainly we're doing doing that. Uh, I think that nicely leads me on to as well um, the, the, the third point, uh, which is around clients um, and 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 doing the right thing and acting for the right people. Obviously, we have professional standards, as, as most professional services firms will have, that are dictated by our regulators, um, regardless of our own views about what we can do and what we can't do. And there's, there's, there's an absolute no-no in terms of doing anything with clients where you think they're dishonest or anything like that. That's just a, you just don't go there. I suppose you've then got this piece in the middle, which is certainly an area that we are thoroughly reviewing at the moment. Um, again, I'd, I'd link this back to the scarce resource point because actually I think most professional service firms at the moment have got more work than they can cope with. Um, and, and, and that is looking at our client base and improving the quality of our client base. And that might, how, how do you define quality in that instance? That might be quality in terms of poor fees, poor recovery, poor profitability from that. Um, it might be quality in terms of just disorganized clients and therefore very difficult for us to do a good job and a proper job in terms of what our role is, whether that's as auditor, typically as auditor, or whether that's as, as, as tax advisor, or, or frankly, and I'll be very open, perhaps they're just not very nice to deal with and perhaps they cause our people, our own staff, um, stress, anxiety, etc., just because of the way they are. And, you, you know, we are going through our client base at the moment and, and looking at all of those areas, profitability, disorganized and poor, unpleasant to deal with and saying, look, which of these are we going to cut out? Now, that's not to say that you might have a difficult client, but he's pretty organized and is good profitability and you might stick with that and you, you you know we can't we can't be too picky with all of this but but i think it's i i think and i know i'm talking to to lots of other professional firms i do think the boot is on our foot at the moment um in terms of looking at and acting for the right people now i know that's slightly different to ken's angle of acting for the right clients but it all sort of probably matches in and filters in so those are the those are the areas I'd respond to, Richard. And... Um, that's, that's really interesting. And I think one of the things I found quite interesting as well is this 
distinction between recurring and non-recurring work using audit terminology for a minute. In other words, when you have a regular client and audit is an obvious one, but many for many law firms that are on panels, so it's, uh, then it's somewhat easier to look at patterns and take a view whether this has been a client that has been caused your staff a bad, bad time, taken up a lot of management time with minimal profitability, et cetera. Whereas I sense with Ken's world, I remember years ago, an architectural firm telling me that they've been approached by, I think, a university who said, oh, you built a lovely building for us 40 years ago. Could you do us another one, please? Uh, that's rather a long time lag between client engagement. So how do you, how do you cope with this uh, analysis, this audit, if you like, Ken, when you're actually dealing more in a transactional world? I mean, I just think you have to attract the right clients. I think actually what Jeremy's saying is completely what we do. You know, our marketing, as David was saying, is all about promoting our ethics. And we're trying to attract the right people to come to us. We're not, you know, we're not out there, um, you know, sacking clients. We're out there trying to get the right clients to start with. I think that's the most important thing to try and attract the right consultants, the right clients to, to come and work with us. Um, you know, and people, we have also another policy that Jeremy touched on, which is we only like to work with nice people, you know, <laughs> whether that's internally or externally, we only like to work with people we actually like, you know, um, and in places where we like going and things like that. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's not that we um, actively go around, um, you know, uh, antagonizing people we just try and get the right people to come to us in the first place and we you know 40 years probably is a sort of normal building process we should have seen some of the projects <laughs> it's like that's quite a quick one <laughs> uh, I love it 40 years um, David Mark how do you market a, a client that only gives you a job once every 40 years um, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question uh, I'm too young I'm too young to answer that question um, to pick up on a couple of other things, though, um, both uh, Francesca and Jeremy made the point about res response when something goes wrong. Um, and actually, I think sometimes I've, I've been in a situation once uh, where something went really badly wrong um, and there was lots of panic. Um, and then we worked out what we might do to try and resolve it. Um, and without actually thinking about will we be transparent and all that kind of stuff, we just did it um, as kind of as a natural process. And kind of ironically, what happened out of that process was the clients thought we'd done really well and uh, we actually won lots of new business out of it <laughs> because clients came back and said, this is great that you responded so quickly that you just told the truth, you put your hands up and you said what you've done wrong, you said what you're going to do differently. Um, and again, kind of ironically, it, it started lots of conversations between the professionals in that business and the clients that we might not otherwise have had. So I'm, I'm not suggesting to go off and do something really unethical in order to have a good response to it. But if you do have something like that, actually um, the response is probably what's remembered much more than the thing that went wrong. So even in this conversation, I remember much more what we did to correct it and the response of clients than the thing that we actually uh, didn't do didn't do right. Yeah, that's interesting because there is some research. I don't. I think it's a bit flaky. I'm not sure, but anyway, in the sort of marketing myths, maybe which says that um, if you merely give a great service, you get a certain satisfaction rating. But if you make a mistake and then you're seen to more than compensate for that mistake, you actually end up with a better rating. Um, I think that's a very risky strategy. But what do you think about that approach, Francesca? <laughs> There's a nice hospital fast, Richard. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> well, you kind of hope you don't, it's a problem you don't have, but when it arise, it, there's something quite interesting around the relationship between supplier and client when things are going horribly wrong. Um, and that can be in a range of ways, slightly less controversially. If a client's having a tough time and you're standing by them, uh, either by freezing fees or providing some leniency around that, the client remembers that. They remember it forever. Uh, and I think there's something that comes, comes through when you've got difficult uh, moments uh, where, in situations where if you're behaving in a very um, 
pragmatic, thoughtful, consistent way and really open about what you're trying to do to put things right if things have gone wrong or work with a client when they're having a shocking time. Clients have shocking times from time to time. Um, I think that is really much, that's very much remembered and very much appreciated in terms of that, um, the, the sort of independent relationship between advisor and client. You know, it's uh, it's not a marriage, uh, but it is a in good times and bad times relationship uh, within the sort of regulatory guidelines we operate in. But there's something really important about how how things uh, how you operate under pressure and how or what you do when things go badly that people remember and often remember because it was such an awful time for everybody it sticks to the memory yeah i i do remember years ago uh, this was when i was at uh, as, as at kpmg at peak market time and there's a story of a particular manager who who left a file on a train uh, apparently and um the uh, the story went along the lines that he was um, had to then go and sort of uh, grovel to all these difficult partners and apologise for having left this file on the train. I don't think it was actually, you know, like state secrets or anything like that. Um, anyway, when it then came up to the review as to who was going to get promoted to the next stage, his was the only name that the partners recognised. Whoops. <laughs> Jeremy, um, just kind of picking up where we're going with this conversation. Um, one of the issues in any firm is this balance between management uh, telling partners what to do and partners having the autonomy to do what they want. And I know that's always a very difficult dividing line in terms of particularly if a particular partner feels very strongly and they're very big biller, et cetera, et cetera. But when it, when it comes to the, this area of uh, making sure there is a consistency of uh, the way that you, for example, measure client <clears throat> Engagement, contribution, profitability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Where, where do you think management should be focused in terms of you can't really lose the autonomy and the independence of the frontline partners on the one hand. At the same time, if you have a group of mavericks, then you end up in a not a good place often. Where, where do you think that fits? Yeah, and I, and I, I think that's a, a, a very good point, Richard. And certainly, you know, those are some of the challenges when we say when we're currently saying to partners, you know, can you re review your por portfolios and see which clients we should be culling for poor quality, poor recovery, what, what, whatever. And of course, not everyone looks at that the same. And, and you might have one partner who's under pressure, perhaps with their fee income um, compared to another, and therefore they're, they're more reluctant to, 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 to cull things. I, I think I think that's that that's about culture really and and certainly as a firm we are trying to move away from a culture of individual partner fee lines and that sort of thing we, uh, and maybe we're in that sort of transition phase from a from a phrase I've used before which is transitioning from a big small firm to a small big firm um, and, and 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 that's part of changing our culture so so we have to we certainly are building more teams within the business and more groups within the business so they have a responsibility and the focus is on them rather than individual partners um i think it's about regular communication from management getting getting the right messages out building that culture you know we're really in that transition away from from focus on fees 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 to, to focus on quality clients, as I say, that covers a, a wide range of things. So, so I think it's about, you know, certainly what's working for us is, is building teams within the business such that they're working together and no one's under specific pressure. Thanks. Um, Ken, where, where would you see your firm on that spectrum that Jeremy has been talking about in terms of autonomy for the individual um, architect in your case, uh, as opposed to management saying this is what we Shannon can't do. I was interested in you to read about the, the panel that you created to sort of advise on ethical issues. Perhaps you might want to talk a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're employee owned. So I set up the business um, 17 years ago as an employee owned uh, business. So everybody effectively is a partner of the business. We call ourselves partners. Uh, we're actually all employees, including me. Um, so it works in a very sort of um, lateral way. Um, you know, we, we have directors because we have to have directors, but we never really have board meetings. Um, it's more everybody, um, you know, is motivated by the fact they work. They're basically partners and share in the business. And I think that's really important to the whole, the whole way we work. And that, um, but also I'm very exploratory as an architect. I like to sort of, um, to see different things. I don't want to do the same thing twice. I want to actually move forward all the time especially in the low carbon environment. 
Um, so we really encourage people to come up with ideas, whether you're a student, whether you're an architect, whether whoever you are in the business, um, everybody has a sort of ability to sort of chip in uh, and be part of those teams and things. Um, and then the, the, the comm side of it, to go back to David's point, I mean, our comms completely comes from the ethics of the company. It's completely embedded. There's no differentiation between the comms, you know, what we say and what we actually do. We try and all the time the comms comes from the values that we set up originally, which is to do the right thing, save the planet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so from our point of view, I think, you know, we have the autonomy with people who are really good. I mean, someone I've worked with for 30 years, um, you know, I know them really well, I trust them really well. And I think it's that sort of having that ability to trust people, but also they have respect for me. So I can, you know, I could, I could bail into a project and um, nobody's going to sort of, you know, wonder what I'm doing. Uh, you know, you can actually get stuck in and they just respect that. So I think for us, I think the employee ownership um, has been so successful for us. Where we were one of the first architects to do it. Um, and, you know, a lot of other architects have actually followed us because they've actually decided, it's, you know, because their staff were asking why they were employee owned and getting a bonus <laughs> and sharing in the sort of decision making and profits and things. Um, so a lot of other architects have changed. But when we first set up, it was a differentiator. It's no longer necessarily a differentiator. The picking up, you are picking up the other points around your, your panel that you've created on, on sort of ethical guidance. Yeah, sorry. Like that, because in a way, I, I mean, I, I, I get the point about employee ownership and everybody's sort of sharing and feeling part of the conversation. But if you're not careful, that can lead to a, a, a lack of, uh, I was going to say, clarity around what really matters because everybody's chipping in. Uh, it's a bit like appraisals where a year ago everybody said two years ago, we don't need them. But actually, because we just want to do on the job feedback, but then actually when it came to it, people said, hang on, I find it quite difficult to know where I'm at if I don't have yeah. at least an annual get together. Well, where does the, on the ethics side, how do you actually internally make sure that those ethical values are shared in a more effect, in an effective way? The, the ethics, I mean, it's not a kibbutz, you know, it's not a, it's not a sort of free for all, it's properly managed business, it's not a sort of, you know, it's not completely wild. Um, so it is managed to the top, and the ethics do actually have a little um, committee we set up. It's interesting, after Black Lives Matter came up, I mean, a lot of people just did blank screens for the day and then did nothing else afterwards. Um, you know, we actually set up a panel uh, with external consultants in who come in now on a, um, a sort of monthly, uh, sorry, two monthly basis to talk about you know, the, 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 um, the way we should actually talk about uh, these issues. Um, so that, and that text transmitted through the company, through, um, uh, fr we have something called Friday Live, where we all talk to each other on Friday at about five o'clock. Um, and that's, you know, takes on, takes those sort of issues uh, and puts them across the company, so everybody's sort of aware of it. Um, and we have an international one as well, where we do all three offices together. So we can actually get those messages across to everybody. So I think, you know, because of the flat structure, it's quite easy to disseminate information. Um, you know, we're all in one space, effectively. Um, you know, lockdown's been more difficult with 140 people on their kitchen tables. But I mean, you know, effectively, we're all, we all work together. Um, there's no, you know, my office is here. There's no walls behind me. It's, you know, part of the, start of the main studio. And that allows a sort of osmosis, I think to work much better and we're all packed in we know we're not sitting in different floors all on one level so i think that osmosis is much more easy to get through get through to the company and everybody on it so the, i think the values um you know really do really do come through um in the way we actually think and work well thank you ken and thank you everybody and sadly it's 10 o'clock so uh, i'm gonna have to call this discussion to a halt but Thank you very much to our panel. Thank you to Ken for sharing. And I wasn't accusing you of a free for all, don't worry. Um, thank you to uh, David for discovering that ethical marketing is not an oxymoron, but is actually quite important to the commercial business. Uh, thank you for Jeremy for sharing his thoughts on how, uh, obviously, sorry to read about it. I mean, a very small client I know shouldn't even have been listed probably, but something that, you know, absolutely will, management will learn from. And I love your going from a, a, a big small to a small big. I think that's a really lovely way of looking at it. And thank you to Francesca for pointing out that when things go wrong, unfortunately, they have a rather a long tail. Um, so probably better not to be there in the first place. So uh, which said, we all make mistakes. It's a human world. I mean, I probably pressed a few of the wrong buttons today, but I've thoroughly enjoyed hosting what I thought was a really interesting uh, conversation around a topic that really should 
and could and should be fairly top of the agenda for most firms, I think, in the, in the current climate, because with ESG and with COP and everything else, you can't be seen to be out of alignment with those much more important values, let alone, as Ken said, saving the planet. So thank you again, and we'll see you next week. And next week, I'm afraid I'm losing Francesca, which is a bit sad. I'm sure she's got a very good reason. She hasn't told me what it is yet. But um, I'd like to say that we've got Catherine McGuinness, who is the uh, head of the City of London, and she's talking a bit about what's London going to feel like looking into the hybrid world. And John Geldart, who is the uh, Director General of the IOD, talking a little bit about how directors can become more professional. And I think that's those two areas are really important as well. Uh, if we're dealing with clients and the directors are unprofessional, a lot of what that's what the white government white paper was about. So I'm a little bit over. My apologies, all of one minute. But thank you again. And I look forward to seeing, um, well, many of you regulars, I know, but seeing you next week. And thank you, our guests. And the YouTubes will be up very shortly. And please go there because there are actually hundreds of people who are watching all those YouTubes all the time. Bye for now.